Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Brackett. I'm the president and CEO of the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. I want to welcome you to the first in a series of small business webinars uh, that we will be presenting jointly with the New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Uh, this series of webinars comes at a very sobering time for small businesses, and the webinars will be focused on small businesses. The most recent survey of the National Federation of Independent Businesses shows optimism among small business owners as very low right now. Uh, the reason for this sentiment, I think, is very clear. They've been desperately trying to find qualified workers for many, many months, and now they are simultaneously dealing with a level of inflation that has not been seen in, in more than a generation. In fact, the most recent survey of the NFIB shows that inflation is now the number one concern amongst the small business community. Our webinar today is going to address the issue of inflation and ways small businesses can cope with that. We are fortunate to have Tom Sullivan of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce here to discuss that issue with us. In a moment, I will turn the webinar over to Bill Tappel, Director of Underwriting for New Jersey Manufacturers, to introduce Tom Sullivan. But before I do, a quick reminder that uh, we will be taking Q&A um, after the presentation. And if you would please submit your questions via the chat box, we will get to as many questions as we can uh, within the hour. I would like to again thank New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group for being our sponsor and partner for this uh, series of webinars as they were last year also. It is now my pleasure to introduce Bill Tappel, Director, Underwriting for New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group. Bill? Thank you. Morning, I'm Bill Taffel, Director of Commercial Lines Underwriting at NJM Insurance Group. NJM is a proud sponsor of this first of five webinars focused on the needs of small businesses. I wanna thank the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to briefly speak with you today. The New Jersey Chamber has been the voice of businesses in the Garden State for more than a century and a vocal advocate on their behalf in the corridors of Trenton. NJM, was founded 109 years ago by business owners for business owners to help protect employers and their employees at the workplace. For more than 70 years, we've been the largest writer of workers' compensation insurance in New Jersey. We're also a leader in commercial auto insurance. For the better part of a century, we only wrote those two lines of business. However, we knew that we had to expand to better serve our policyholders and potential new customers to stay competitive in an ever-changing marketplace. One of the reasons for our expansion to accommodate existing policyholders in New Jersey who had grown their operations in neighboring states. We want to help them grow and in turn grow with them. NJM is now a leading regional insurer offering insurance in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Delaware, New York, and Maryland. Last year, we launched the ProEdge Business Owners Policy, which combines protection for common risks that small business owners face. With ProEdge, businesses can save time and money by bundling multiple coverages such as property, liability, business in income insurance, and industry-specific coverages under one insurance policy. Last month, we introduced NGM ProPAC, a commercial package policy. A ProPAC policy combines protection for property and liability risks for mid to large size businesses. These new policies complement our workers' comp and commercial auto policies, offering a total account solution. Our business policyholders receive the highest level of service, including access to certified loss prevention specialists. This focus on safety, long and NJM hallmark, helps business owners identify the correct workplace hazards before accidents occur. And if an injury should happen, our claims and medical service professionals work to mitigate losses and contain claim costs. If you're not already an NJM business policyholder, I encourage you to visit njm.com and learn more about the benefits of NJM insurance. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Tom Sullivan is Vice President of Small Business Policy at the US Chamber of Commerce. In this role, Tom works with chambers of commerce across the nation to harness the views of small businesses and translate those views into federal policies that bolster free enterprise and reward entrepreneurship. 
Thomas practiced law at the prestigious firm of Nelson, Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough. He joined the George W. Bush administration and served at the highest ranking government official charge with advocating for small business before government agencies and Congress. Tom has also served at the U.S. Small Business Administration as well as on the advisory board of the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Legal Center, the board of directors of Global Entrepreneurship Network, and he served as general counsel for the Bipartisan Policy Center. We are glad he was able to carve out time to be with us today. Here is Tom Sullivan. Thank you for joining us, Tom. Oh, thank you, Bill. And thank you, Tom, for having me to kick off this small business series. I'm going to share my screen and go through a uh, deck. I actually, for those of you who I've spoken with before, you, you probably realize that I get pretty emotional and passionate about these issues. And so uh, the, the deck is really to keep me on track instead of going down rabbit holes that my passion for small business sometimes take me. So thank you for bearing with me on, on the deck. Uh, really only eight slides and I'll try to be prompted to communicate with you what I'm seeing about inflation uh, what some folks are doing about inflation, what we're joining with the New Jersey Chamber to try to convince Congress to do about inflation, and then most importantly, engage you with questions and hopefully answers to those questions. So let's start off by uh, who I am, or more importantly, who the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is. We are celebrating our 110th anniversary this month, um, and one of the things that we're most proud of is our relationship with local, state, and regional chambers of commerce. When you walk into our headquarters, which is directly across from the White House, across from Lafayette Square, you're greeted with this magnificently large brass plaque. And that brass plaque represents the, hundred, the hundreds of local and state chambers of commerce who banded together 110 years ago to bring a voice of their business community to Washington, DC. It is a daily reminder to me uh, about the importance of the New Jersey Chamber and your peers all across the country. So in that peer relationship that we have with state, local, and regional chambers of commerce, we have roughly 3 million business members. That 3 million includes the membership of about 1,600 state, local chambers, and a, the membership of about 500 trade associations. About 96% of the, the businesses who belong to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have fewer than 100 employees. 75% of our membership have fewer than 10 employees. So it really is a membership organization driven by small business membership. So diving right into some of the details and the data that I review on a, on a daily, weekly, quarterly basis, we work with MetLife to survey small businesses every quarter. That gives us a good sense of what's going on uh, around the country. I mean, with 3 million members, we can't talk with every one of our members. Uh, we talk with as many as possible because it keeps us grounded on Main Street for what types of policies and issues we should be involved with. But sometimes it's good just to take a broader temperature through a survey instrument. We work with a survey firm called Ipsos that, uh, that surveys small businesses every quarter. Our latest small business index actually was pretty positive. And I know that that kind of flies in the face of, of some of the information and some, quite frankly, some of the pain that we're feeling right now in high inflation. But there's also some good news that is hidden behind those inflationary pressures that I'll get to a little bit. But that index score, which there's 10, uh, 10 survey questions and the, the makeup of those responses make up an index that we've been tracking for over four years. 
It's actually the highest level since the start of the pandemic. Now, if I could pretend to be an economist for a second, there's good news and bad news. The good news is it's the, that this, the previous quarter was the highest it's been since the start of the pandemic. Bad news is we've still got a long way to go before we get into the levels we saw January, February, 2020, immediately prior to the pandemic. So there's a lot of work, uh, a lot of work to be done. Now, some of these things that I'll talk with you about are just intuitive to being a small business owner or being part of the small business stakeholder community. Um, and that to me, that means that we're actually, our, our surveys are accurate. So uh, some of the things they talk about are really obvious to you. It's my job and the job of Bill and Tom and others um, to try to make what we know every day front and center on what the lawmakers in Washington, DC and in state capitals throughout the country know. But getting at what we know, which is the worker shortage, that we, we try to dig into what does this worker shortage mean? Do small businesses still want to hire? The answer is yes. Over 50% of small businesses are concerned with filling open jobs. And what I included in this deck is something that's, that we found that, that I didn't expect. And that's actually the beauty of these indexes is finding out stuff that you wouldn't intuitively know. We know as business community advocates that wages are going up to attract and keep qualified and willing employees. What was surprising to me in the index is what we found that flexibility unique to the employment situation at small businesses just started ranking above wages as far as what attracts employees and what keeps small businesses most valued employees. So flexibility now leapfrogged up into the highest uh, measurement of what attracts and keeps employees. And that's something, that's something that is, is worth noting because as what I hear, small businesses always want to attract new employees and keep uh, their best employees. And so nationwide, we see that flexibility, and that means flexibility in schedules, uh, flexibilities in location, um, it used to mean that used to mean that it, you you lived and worked close to each other. Now it means uh, a lot of the work at home component that is it has become a new workplace phenomenon since since COVID. But that flexibility now ranks above wage rates as far as finding and keeping valued employees. All right, now we get really into the nitty gritty of what. This, this session is about inflation. And again, some of this stuff is just common sense. Um, and then it's up to folks in the stakeholder community to bring that common sense to our policymakers. No surprise, 85%, this is probably even higher now because this is last quarter's numbers. 85% of small businesses are concerned about inflation. So what, what does that mean? because we ask small businesses, how do you rank certain things? Um, inflation, finding and, and hiring employees, um, supply chains, actually a big set of, of pressures and so forth. So 33% of the small businesses surveyed rank inflation at the top. So, keep, so to put that in perspective, that's 10 points higher than the previous quarter. And if we look year over year, this ranking is double the percentage it was a year ago. So certainly worth paying attention to as far as like what is front and center on the minds of small businesses. So what are small businesses doing about it? Well, they're raising prices. Again, not, not shocking information, but many policy makers don't know how difficult it is to raise prices. I was speaking with a, a coffee shop owner um, in Winchester, Virginia recently. And she walked me through the actual process of raising prices. It, in, 
and I had never really thought through the step by step. So she has to contact all of the electronic ordering apps, change the prices on all the social platforms, Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. Then she's got to actually physically change, and, and there are printing costs involved, the actual menus, and which, which is a royal pain in the neck. I'll keep this PG, a royal pain in the neck. But then she actually talked with me about the hardest part of raising prices, which is socializing this concept with the staff who are actually selling the coffee, and then socializing and getting buy-in from their most important, well, actually their most important are their staff, but the second most important, which pay for the staff, are the customers. And this, this woman was explaining to me that, you know, coffee, especially like a latte and all that fancy stuff, that, that, she considers that a luxury item. That is discretionary spending. Now, for those of you who know me, there's nothing discretionary about coffee for, for me. I, I need it to actually get up and get going in the morning. But for a coffee shop in the middle of kind of a tourist town that specializes in some high margin servings, those are luxury items. And if she doesn't get the buy-in from her customer base that understands that she's raising prices because she has to, then her whole business model starts to fail. And so that is actually the hardest thing she has to do is training her staff and then socializing the rationale with her customer base. So that is a little bit of an insight into what many folks know, but policymakers don't seem to know about how hard it is to raise prices. And that actually leapfrogs over the emotional component because most small businesses I speak with do not like raising prices. There is a tremendous fear that you raise prices, you take that special, special smallness out of the overall equation and you somehow insult your customer base. So there's that emotional leap you've got to get over. Now, after all of that, and even when we see that two out of every three small businesses are raising prices, still have to acknowledge that even with higher prices to cope with inflation, the margins are shrinking. And that's something that is troubling. So when you look at these data uh, every week, every month, every quarter, a little scary when you're raising prices, but the amount of money that you're able to pour back into your business is shrinking. That's a dangerous equation uh, that, that is of concern to me and, and many others. So then we get at, well, what, is, what are the feds doing about inflation? The feds, obviously, if, 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 you, um, you, if you're living under a rock and you haven't read or been exposed to anything in the last week, then this will be a shocking news to you. The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates pretty aggressively. And our small businesses know that that's what has to be done to cool the economy a little bit and to, to stabilize some of these prices. That doesn't mean that small businesses like it. I mean, it is some bitter tasting medicine. And when we surveyed small businesses on this, 70% are concerned with the impact rising interest rates have on their businesses. And I do, want to, I, I do want to put a fine point on this because some incredible small business owners from Memphis, Tennessee visited with me last week. And they wanted to know, well, like who, who's impacted by higher interest rate? The, the answer is we all are, but there are small business populations that are affected worse. And those are the cash dependent small businesses. Any small business that either relies on uh, cash for revenues or actually has cash outstanding for rent and, and other items, then you're going to be more subject to variables in interest rates. The higher they go, those cash dependent small businesses get hit the hardest. So enough of the doom and gloom for, for a minute. I want to kind of talk a little bit about what I referenced earlier about some good news that is behind some of these inflationary pressures. Uh, again, not necessarily intuitive, but good to know. After the recession, it took 
small businesses 10 years to go into a positive growth mode. So not to nerd out too much, but small business growth has remained relatively flat, a little bit inching up for the last 20, 30 years. During the recession, small business startup growth tanked. It took 10 years for that curve to turn around and start going upward slowly. During the pandemic, startups, new business growth also plummeted in March, 2020. It only took four months for the curve to turn around. And there has been aggressive startup growth since about July, August, 2020. Now, I, I don't have the capacity to think in such complex terms as some of my economist friends do. And they have these very, very complicated theories about why there is a, such a significant growth trajectory of new businesses. My rationale is pretty simple. It's an understanding that small businesses solve problems. That's what they do. They capitalize on a challenge that needs to be solved to provide some good, some benefit. Well, at no point, at least in my lifetime, have I seen more problems. Therefore, entrepreneurs rushed into the space to solve problems. And that justifies the significant uptick in startup applications for, for jobs. This is, I say applications because basically these data are all based on the applications for employer identification numbers, EINs. Uh, and there is some evidence that those applications turn into businesses. And also there's some evidence that those businesses actually become employer businesses very quickly. The, the immediate growth was uh, transportation, warehousing, and logistics. I mean, how many deliveries can Uber, UPS, and FedEx uh, accomplish? And the answer is that not enough. So when everyone started working from home, there was this tremendous need for additional infrastructure to provide delivery, warehousing, and logistics. Now, after that leveled off, those same small businesses morphed into online sales platforms. We see a, an uptick for those of you who are in the retail industry, you're familiar with the term omni-channel. Omni-channel means that the purchase comes from a mix of online experience and in-person experience. This omni-channel phenomenon now is spread across the entire um, business ecosystem from business to business to services. And then again, it's been for a long time in the retail. And so that gr sharp growth in warehousing, transportation and logistics has leveled off a little bit, but those same businesses are morphing into omni-channel experiences um, and they're still growing a little bit slower rate than they were in 2020. But we see data that show that there's over a half a million more small businesses created over the last year than in an ordinary year. Now, my geese and the golden eggs concept that is on this slide deck. At the US Chamber of Commerce, and we are joined certainly by our friends in New Jersey and all across the country, while there is good news about startup growth, there's also a cautionary tale to our friends in government say, let's nurture these startups. Let's not try to micromanage them in a way that will actually kill the geese that is laying the golden eggs. I was um, doing a, a webinar last week where we sit down with a Republican and a Democrat member of Congress. We, we call this series our Common Grounds series, which is uh, named that because uh, Common Grounds is a reference to coffee. And there is a phenomenon of when folks have coffee, they sometimes sit around and chat. They break down barriers that sometimes exist that prevent uh, compromise and bipartisanship. 
So we feel very strongly that if we're able to have a conversation around coffee or a beer or a glass of wine or a soda, uh, we will be able to come up with more bipartisan solutions. And during this conversation, we talked about the appropriate role that government has when it comes to small business. And this uh, Democratic member, Congressman Dean Phillips uh, from Minnesota, he put it really well. He said, government should be a wheelbarrow, not a wall. And I, I've thought about that a great deal in the last seven, eight days. And I think he's absolutely right. We've come up with a small business bill of rights that tries to say that in a little bit of fancier words. But quite frankly, these five principles that small businesses have told us are important. Tell government to nurture business, not micromanage them and, and crush them. And so uh, we are encouraging policymakers to look at these small business bill of rights, talk with their small business constituents, and then perhaps endorse or embrace this small business bill of rights. Uh, last but not least, we want to take all the stuff that I've talked about uh, and do an even better job of amplifying the individual examples we see of the best small businesses in New Jersey and across the country. So we have our annual Dream Big Awards. Um, if, if this is something that you or, or a friend of yours would be uh, an appropriate candidate for, uh, please have them apply or please apply yourself. Uh, the URL for these Dream Big Awards are in, uh, are in this deck slide. Uh, there is a grand prize of $25,000 for the Small Business of the Year. And every one of our finalists in each of the eight categories, uh, we, we try our best to try to magnify their significance, their leadership and their communities through a number of different media platforms. So it's fairly good exposure, even if you're not the top winner. So I said last but not least, and I lied, I apologize. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, and this is really a commitment to all of you. Make sure you know this, is, I'm not a one and done type of guy. Um, I work with Tom every week, every month, every quarter, every year, and we're committed to providing information, whether it's through great series like New Jersey, New Jersey Chamber of Commerce is providing right now, or whether it's through um, online resources, guides, and, and fact sheets, whatever it takes to help make a small business more successful. So the, these are three representative screenshots of some of this information. Um, our information push out really hit a crescendo during COVID. We heard from New Jersey and many other chambers of commerce that they needed help to provide information about an enormous amount of federal assistance designed to help small business. So we served kind of as a closed captioning service. We took, tried to take government speak and translate it into small business speak. And our friends at New Jersey Chamber of Commerce and many other chambers of commerce helped push that information out. Uh, we have right now the America Works Initiative, which really tries to drill into the workforce shortage and solutions at a local level with, with initiatives like talent pipeline management, all the way to a national level where we are very proud of uh, our work with New Jersey and others on J-1 visas, other programs to get more legal workers into the workforce. Um, we certainly believe that one way to actually help relieve inflationary pressures is tariff relief. Not many, you know, we, we are certainly well focused on the price of gas at the pump. Not many people know that the tariffs that exist uh, on the exchange of international goods actually boil down to about $1,200 a year on the average American family. So if we can get more free trade agreements done and reduce the tariffs, you're actually seeing a savings that will help reduce inflationary pressures. And then this middle slide 
is uh, is something that I did want to highlight, and that is our small business digital platform. It's called Co. C O, and you can find this through uschamber.com/co. But this is our digital front door for small business. And what makes it a little bit different is that instead of coming from Washington DC and telling small businesses, this is what you should do, which is kind of the old way of, of doing things. Instead, what we try to do is capture the narratives of small business experiences themselves, have them give advice peer to peer through a digital platform. We've had tremendous success from this. I hear from small business owners that um, this type of information is tremendous. They want more, and we are committed to providing more through our digital platform called Co. So with that, I will stop sharing and then open it up for questions. All right, Tom, thank you. Good information, and I do wanna follow up on some of the things you discussed and also, um, ask you some of the questions that have come in while you were talking, but I wanted to start with a little bit of an off the wall question, perhaps, which we were just recently talking about uh, your discussions with members of Congress. We are, our 1500 or so members ask us this question about the state legislature a lot. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to translate the question into a federal question for you, which is, do you have any sense of about how many members of Congress have either owned or operated a small business or primarily worked for a small business? Uh, thank you. So I don't have an exact number. I do. So both Congressman Phillips and Congresswoman Kim, a Republican from California, they both ran small businesses prior to coming to Congress. And so um, I think the underlying sentiment from that question, see, at least the way I take it, is we could be better off with more folks who come from small business background. Um, there is a handful work primarily with the House Small Business Committee and the Senate Small Business Committee. Uh, and we do hear a lot from um, those members of Congress who did run a small business prior to coming to Congress. And so uh, both Dean Phillips, who even currently actually owns a ice cream and coffee shop uh, in the just north of Minneapolis, um, I think it's called Penny's Coffee. Um, he brings that with him every day in how he approaches his work. And then Congresswoman Kim um, actually started a women a woman's clothing apparel firm prior to coming to Congress. And the lessons that she learned, not only working at a small business, but owning and founding a small business uh, helped shape her perspective every day. So uh, simple answer is a handful of legislators, a more robust answer to the question is we could, we always can need more. And so if you find a couple of small business owners um, who want to get involved in politics, uh, certainly weave them into the New Jersey chamber. There's no better place for uh, a candidate to talk with uh, who we hope would be their allies leading through a process than connecting with your local and state chambers of commerce for advice. All right. So I'd like to go back to uh, your conversation earlier in the program. We talked about the reaction small business has to the inflationary economy that they're dealing with now. We talked about the complications of raising prices. So are there other things small businesses, it, small businesses can do or small business is doing to deal with the inflationary pressures besides raising prices? What else can they do? Yeah, so um, raising prices is the top, as you said. Uh, so I was just speaking with my friends at the National Federation of Independent Business um, yesterday, and it was asking about their latest surveys. And they had, they had explained that the inflationary pressures that are the highest with, within, so if you look within inflation, if you, if you ask small businesses, where does it come from? Um, their supply chains are actually listed at the top. So their cost of supplies have gone up. Um, which, which surprised me. So I, I naively had thought that their highest inflationary pressures would be wage. Um, but, but what I find fascinating about the discussion that I had yesterday that I'm now sharing with you is it, it is a little bit of what you could control and what you can't control. 
And small businesses are feeling between a rock and a hard place when it comes to their supplies. They, they can't control it. Uh, I mean, sure, a lot of small businesses are shopping around for better prices, but at some point, they're still high. So a lot of small businesses are shopping ar around for better prices for their supplies. They're certainly looking more domestically for supplies because the, the added cost of shipping and, and tariffs is, is just too much to bear. But they rank the supply chain higher in an inflationary um, in, in rising prices than wages because in wages, even though folks know that you, you've got to offer hiring bonuses and wages are going up, um, if small business owners still feel as though they're able to have the conversation with the prospective employee, with their most trusted employees, and they're able to, to provide flexibilities beyond just wages to actually get to the positive endpoint, which is either hiring or keeping a trusted and valuable employee. So this ability to control, to be have something, an issue area that you're able to control actually brings wages a little bit lower on the inflation uh, kind of on, on the inflation ranking. So um, what we've heard on how, how small businesses are controlling, you know, during, during COVID, when we kept talking about PPP, many of us insisted like, if you don't have a good relationship with a lender, it's many times that means a, a community bank uh, or a local branch, branch of a national bank, like you better get a good relationship quickly. I don't want to just create kind of a chicken little narrative and keep saying the same thing. Like you really should create a good relationship with a lender, but in inflation, you gotta have a, a good trusted relationship because you've gotta be shifting. You've got to try to shift your, um, your debt structure in a way that isn't gonna get hammered by either crazy ups and downs in the stock market or uh, rising interest rates. And the simple translation is, is shifting towards fixed, fixed rate loans, but it's, it's obviously more complicated with that. And so that relationship with a lender is tremendously important right now. Um, so shifting for better prices for supplies, building that trust relationship with a lender to make sure that your credit uh, strategy meets the same ex expectations of inflation. And then last but not least, there are small businesses that are looking at their employee costs. Um, and I mean, empl employees are expensive. And so we are seeing in some industries, um, small businesses making that really, really tough decision of only opening for a certain amount of hours and then cutting staff because they simply cannot afford the wage inflation when it comes to um, keeping their entire team on board. That's, that's gotta be one of the toughest decisions for a small business owner, but we are starting to see it as a way for small businesses to try and control costs. Isn't it even tougher because so many companies still say they can't even get enough employees to run the business as well as they'd want to, and now they're looking at having to lay off some of them? Yeah, Ray, I, you know, this, this is something that, I, that is front and center on my own daily work. I am fascinated by that dynamic that you just mentioned, is that why do we continue to see small businesses say, you know, next year I'm going to hire up? Why do we keep seeing that when we haven't been able to hire or it's been very difficult to hire for the last two and a half years and it's getting more expensive? And so I, I've gotten the answer to that from some small businesses and actually um, small businesses, primarily in the manufacturing space. The answer has been that we know that inflation is going to level off, but we also are confident that consumer demand is going to remain high. There is still a ton of cash that had been pent up and saved during the pandemic that is coming out of pocketbooks right now. Small businesses are very confident 
that that cash flowing out of pocketbooks is going to continue through the remainder of the year. And if that's the case, once inflation starts leveling off, small businesses are really bullish on increasing staff. And so, so that's what causes an increased confidence, even though right now, if you were to fill up your car with gas, it's like having your face being a punching bag. I mean, it is really, really painful. So small businesses somehow are able to look past that, still have a lot of confidence in hiring up to meet continual high demand going forward. So one of our participants today asked this question, which is kind of related to that. So just ask it as he asked the question to us, which is, do you see hiring going up in the next six to 12 months? Uh, Ray, Ray one, one, one more time. You had said hiring going up in the next six to 12 months. Yeah, do you that, see hiring going correct? up in the next six to 12 months? Uh, I, what our survey show is, is the answer to that is yes. Do you have any sense as to how much? Or what kind of numbers um, you're looking it's, at? It's it so so we we trend to we tend to look at trends. So so in, in my world that means is the trend going up, is it flat, or is it going down? We see that trend actually going up. And again, this I mean great, this gets at, at our, our back and forth a, a few minutes ago. I, I find that I, I find that fascinating. Um, because like a lot of Americans, every time I fill up my tank. It is it is a sobering experience, and and I am amazed and, and quite frankly really lucky to be in the job that I am in advocating for small business, where Main Street entrepreneurs are able to look past this shock and are convinced they're going to be hiring up in the next six to twelve months. And that that's really pretty amazing. I mean, it gives me tremendous confidence in the small business economy. Um, and, but we see it continue. We'll be releasing our latest data in about a week. Um, and I'm hearing whispering that that type of confidence continues to, especially in the hiring, continues to tick up. Okay. We had a question come in, I'll share with you now. Um, this has to do with the slide you showed about uh, the new business starts, new business startups. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know how many of those startups were for secondary income or, you know, as kind of a side gig versus, you know, being a primary income source? So very good question. Uh, simple answer is no. I don't know how many are gigs. Uh, so the, the most work on this is done by an economist named John Haltewanger out of the University of Maryland. So what he does is he dives into this um, employer identification numbers, then he dissects which sectors they're in to try to determine the answer to that. So there's two, two things that go on. One is, is it primary income or secondary income? The second question is, will they stay solopreneurs, not employers, which, which most small businesses in America are actually 83% of America's 31 million small businesses don't have employees. So will they stay non-employers or, or are they likely to grow? And that is actually sector specific information. So uh, keep an eye out for new research by John Haltewanger. I can assure you, he is gonna be answering that question within the next six months. It, it, will, not be, it will not be a nationwide assessment. Oh, these are gig workers or this is full um, primary household income, the answer will be sector specific. There will be a different set of answers with restaurants, hotels, and other venues from professional services. Because we're already seeing, starting to see slight differences, but Haltewanger is already digging into these data and he should have a good, good answer for that uh, within the next six months. Okay. So you talked earlier about the uh, the uh, that flexibility was becoming a more important uh, issue for workers than wages, even to some degree. So, based on that, would you say that the work from home workforce environment is probably here to stay? So, Ray, uh, again, so, so yes, I believe that the 
added tool for, for, for some of those uh, fellow food lovers out there, the added item on the, buff, on the buffet for workforce is absolutely um, a hybrid work environment. But this, like, this, this is one of the beauties of America's free enterprise. Every small business is different. Every small business has its own story and what works for one small business may not work for another small business. And um, even within small businesses, and this is what makes it additionally crazy, sometimes frustrating because you can't make these broad pronouncements, even within a small business, there are certain jobs and responsibilities that don't lend themselves to working from home or re remote work. But when we get back into the flexibility thing, you know, small businesses are uniquely situated to be flexible. They always have been. And some folks who don't understand small business think that that's a bad thing. I mean, I run into policymakers who say, oh, you know, every small business owner should be uh, required to provide family leave, vacation leave, um, healthcare, and all these things. These are all valuable benefits for employees, but sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the business owner and the employee at a small business, they're connected. And many times the employer treats that, that employee like a member of their own family. And it's just not so simple to stand on the mountaintop with the mandate saying, thou shalt provide two weeks of vacation. Like sometimes that doesn't work with a small business. And at the heart of that employee employer relationship is flexibility. And so for me, it made my heart uh, full to see that data shows that flexibility jumped over wages because that's what small business is about. And it was great to see data finally that kind of shows what many of us know is inherent in the small business employee employer relationship, which is flexibility. So first time we have data that show this is what the employees want, not just what the business owners want. And so for many decades, that's just the simple truth of small business. So we're going to be talking with policymakers about, look, that we talk about employees want, it's here. And so please stop insisting that every federal idea be mandated on a small business because, you know, not only is it more paperwork for these small businesses, but their employees don't actually want it. And so we're, we're thrilled to have this additional data to kind of prove that point. And some folks uh, who I've spoken with recently believe they have an advantage over some of their larger business comp competitors because there is an inherent legal flexibility small businesses have in providing the types of flexibility that some employees want. And uh, those small businesses are using that to their advantage in a highly competitive worker env environment. So sometimes we hear, well, are, is our larger business going to steal our best employees? And I am sympathetic, but I also ask, well, are some of the unique parts of your business going to allow for you <laughs> to steal employees from your larger business competitors? And so I hope the answer to both of those is a little bit of an uncomfortable yes. Um, because both the large and the small have different advantages to get the right employee in the right place for maximum benefit for all involved. Okay. All right, we have a few more minutes. I got a couple of macro level questions I'd like to get to if we can here. And actually, let's turn to politics for a minute since that's always somewhere in this equation all the time, isn't it? So, uh, I mean, most of the pundits you read or listen to now say, that the Republicans are, bo are poised for a very good midterm election will come November. Um, Jeff, have you heard, do you know, is he, are the Democrats, as far as you know, planning anything 
that they're going to create and they're going to billboard as you know relief against the inflationary pressures that businesses and consumers are are currently uh, facing and do so in time for it to be an equation in the election coming up and so can they possibly do anything without joe manchin being involved uh -huh. So I, well, you know, you never have to apologize about bringing politics into a discussion. I mean, that's, that's, we're a company town in Washington, DC, that that's our company. And so uh, I, I welcome those types of questions or observations. So uh, unfortunately, I think what we've seen uh, as far as economic recovery from the White House, which is kind of the brand of the Democratic Party, is this, this insistence of micromanaging businesses out of the economy. And and, and that just doesn't work. Um, and, and the way I think about it is very much the way I view what I've learned as a husband. And that is that wanting to be helpful and being helpful are sometimes two different things. And I think the Democratic Party uh, led by the White House in, in primarily their um, economic recovery initiative, Build Back, Build Back Better, I don't question their motives. I think they want people to do better, but that's different actually doing better. And I, I think my, trying to micromanage that recovery is the wrong way to go. We saw it actually even in PPP, which was a tremendous benefit for small businesses. But when the federal government kind of came in and said, okay, you can spend it for wages, but you can't spend it for mortgage payments or capital, uh, you know, capital costs that you've spent prior to the pandemic. Like, it just didn't work. The, the, the folks from Washington, DC trying to micromanage, micromanage the cost structure in an individual restaurant, it, it got really difficult. And thankfully, members of Congress, primarily those who had run small businesses prior to coming to Congress, they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's give small businesses more flexibility. And they actually passed amendments to PPP that allowed greater flexibility. So I'm not saying that, um, that bipartisanship doesn't produce results because it does. And so I think the approach that we've seen thus far from a micromanaged perspective is the wrong way to go. And I think that the midterms are gonna play this out and that the business community knows that it is gonna do best when it's able to be, to, to, um, to provide jobs and build communities through its own entrepreneurship and innovation, as opposed to the federal government saying, okay, you can only sell your business to this business. You can't sell your business to a venture capital on Wall Street, for instance. Like that type of micromanaging is not gonna work and it's gonna hurt, I think, the Democrats in the midterms. Now, as far as like what happens after the election, you know, at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we are we know that both the House and the Senate have razor thin majorities right now, and we are hoping to build up that governing center. Republicans that want, for instance, to improve infrastructure, and took really tough votes to pass the bipartisan infrastructure legislation. That's what governing is about. And the Democrats who, who believe that we should be reducing tariffs to reduce inflationary pressures and help small businesses, that's what governing is about. So we're looking at building that center. And quite frankly, we know that after the elections, it's still gonna be razor thin margins both in the House and the Senate. We're hoping that, that those razor thin margins equate to a broader middle that want to govern and get things done. Okay. Well, don't stop at the hour. I've got one more question for you to close it out. And uh, it used to be called the $64,000 question, but in this age of inflation, I don't know what that translates to now, but essentially it's this, the R word, recession. Are we in one already? Are we going to be in one? Can we avoid it? Where, where does the U.S. Chamber come down on that? So from a small business perspective, as long as consumer spending remains high, we're not going into a recession. Okay, so it all, it's all dependent on spending. You see? Yes. Okay. All right. Any last comments or anything you want to make before we, we close it out? 
Well, Ray, just a, a heartfelt thank you uh, to you and, and to Tom and, and Bill and others. Uh, I know that this is more than just a series. It's a commitment to move forward to get information into the hands of our business membership. And so thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for your time and your expertise today and for joining us. We appreciate it very much. Very informative hour. Thank you. Also, thank um, you. and also thanks to, uh, to the Chamber in general for all you do for American business, which is substantial. So thank you for that as well. And thanks to New Jersey manufacturers, uh, Bill Tuffle, and to Grant Canella, who I work with there very frequently for helping uh, put this together. We do have four more of these webinars scheduled for uh, the balance of this year and information about the next one will be coming out very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Until then, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Have a good day. Have a profitable day. Thank you, everybody.